The sophistication of Advaita Vedanta means that it is prone to a lot of misconceptions. In this conversation with Dr. Kathi Rasan, we try to address all of them. Dr. Kathi Rasan is the founder of Center for Mindfulness Singapore, an author of four books and a strategic leader and thinker with an experience of more than 25 years. In this episode, we cover a wide range of topics such as bliss, maya, avidya, jagat mithya, jagat karanam, samadhi, moksha, karam yoga and the role of meditation in the Advaita Vedanta tradition. This episode is a brilliant beginner's introduction to Advaita Vedanta and I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Dr. Kathi Rasan. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, and we hope to learn a lot from you today. Uh, before we start, a quick introduction to your background, to your journey, to who you have been to this point. So um, I'm, I was born in Singapore and I've lived uh, in Singapore all my life. And um, I, I spent my early years, uh, when, I use, when I use the term early years, it's very relative. Uh, I would say my teenage years, you know, in school, I, and I, I was first trained in engineering. And that kind of, um, you know, created a very, very inquisitive um, mind, I would say, wanting to know mm. things, wanting to understand things from an analytical perspective. And then, um, I, and then in Singapore, I believe many may know, you get conscripted to serve in the military. And then mm. I was in the military. And therein, uh, during that particular uh, period, I think I was searching for answers. I guess uh, many, many people in this uh, in this path or in this philosophy, in this philosophical tradition will always say there is a search. All right. Uh, and the same thing happened to me, but in my own ways, uh, in my own way, it was a little different in the sense that I was looking for answers. I had existential questions. Mm. And then uh, the works of uh, Swami Vivekananda was the first one that hit me very, very deep. Very, very, insp- it was very inspiring. And through the works of uh, Swami Vivekananda, of course, uh, that includes uh, Sri Ramakrishna's works as well. And through that, I wanted to learn from a teacher. So I was looking for a teacher. And for a couple of years, I was not uh, very lucky. Or rather, uh, I was able to meet many teachers who came into mm-hmm. Singapore. Singapore was, Singapore was very popular. It still remains to, remains very popular for many visiting teachers. They come here like, you know, you have teachers in Singapore, like maybe uh, 12, 20 times a year, you see teachers mm-hmm. coming here and they're giving lectures, a lot of Advaita Vedantins as well. And uh, during one of those lectures where is when I met uh, Swami Dayananda Saraswati from the Arusha Vidya Gurukulam tradition. Mm-hmm. And through him, I met my teacher who is uh, Swami Satprakash Ananda Saraswati. And with him, I learned uh, Advaita Vedanta, looking at uh, studying with him the uh, Shankara's commentaries mm-hmm. on the uh, Upanishads as well as the fundamental texts known as Prakrana Granthas. Now, these were, uh, this was my classical training. This happened from 1999 till 2004. Mm-hmm. And after which I started teaching this to people who, uh, who are interested, who are interested uh, since then. And I still teach, uh, to teach this to select students. Mm. Um, till today. Yep, that's basically a very brief background. I hope it's not too long. Yeah. No, but, and so so did you study at any particular Arsha Vidya Gurukulam in India or were you studying in Singapore itself? Yeah. I was studying in Singapore because my teacher was from Malaysia, which is a mm. neighboring country to mm. Singapore. So the proximity helped a lot. Yeah, so he studied in, uh, in Arsha Vidya Gurukulam in, in Coimbatore. Mm. That's where he learned. He did his, his course in, I think, 20 years ago, was it? Yep. With, uh, with Pujya Swamiji, Swami Dayananda. So that's, that's the, so I did not go, of course, I had some brief stints in the uh, Swami Dayananda Ashram in Rishikesh. Mm-hmm. So I've been there, I've learned with uh, some teachers in 2003, I think. Yeah, I spent some time in Rishikesh and Uttarakashi as well. Yeah. And was this the first initiation into Advaita Vedanta and also, let's say, Sanskrit as well? Or did you have any prior background before getting in touch with them? Actually, I would say that my first exposure mm. through Advaita Vedanta came through text, actually. There wasn't a formal, you know, uh, mm. connection with the teacher. So uh, having met a couple of other teachers, uh, uh, I wasn't satisfied with what I got. Uh, but is, it was with this tradition that I found that, I, I found that my answers, uh, my questions were answered. Mm. 
mm-hmm. that made the difference. I mean, in in no measure is this uh, an estimation of the value that the teachers brought, you know, prior to mm-hmm. this uh, ex- uh, encounter. But just that it didn't meet, it didn't answer my questions. I always mm-hmm. believe in that. It's not that there is a question for everyone. Mm-hmm. Every teacher answers your question, and these teachers did not answer my question. But Swami Dayananda and Swami Satprakashananda answered my questions, and my exposure to Sanskrit though started with this contact. Prior to that, I wasn't exposed to Sanskrit as much. Uh, it was with uh, Swamiji that I started to get exposed to Sanskrit and also learn the importance of uh, language, words, and epistemology. Hmm. Uh, so one thing you mentioned which is interesting is that uh, some teachers answered your questions and some didn't. So it's obviously not a reflection on the teachers. It is like that as the old adage goes, when the student is ready, the, the teacher will arrive, that kind of thing. But just in that context, uh, and also since you've been all teaching for almost two decades now, uh, from your perspective, who is Advaita Vedanta for? And I mean, it, the, the continuing question obviously is who's eligible to study Advaita Vedanta, but who is this mm. philosophy or Darshan Shastra for? Okay. So I, I look. I, I will answer this question from a uh, first a traditional perspective, and then mm-hmm. I will answer this from my own experience as well. Okay. Mm-hmm. Now, if I if I if we look at the tradition, this this subject matter was was meant to be for a person who was a sannyasi, a renunciate. That's the traditional uh, perspective. If you look at all the Advaita Vedanta texts, it it says that it, this knowledge is for the person who has renounced. However, there are some, uh, what I call exceptions to that particular norm, where you see some texts allowing uh, what I call uh, students who are not uh, sannyasis to also learn this knowledge. There has been, ex- it's an exception, not the norm though. Mm. Uh, so there is one particular, and the one, one perspective is that only a renunciate or a sannyasi is eligible. That means a person who has renounced uh, desires or any kind of worldly pursuits and is categorized into three, they call it Putra, Vitta, and Loka, you know, three important uh, desires would have to be renounced. So that is the traditional perspective. But that perspective can be reinterpreted. It, it, has, it has been already reinterpreted in the sense that a person who has a very intense desire for moksha also becomes eligible through that through that same condition, actually. That's, well, that's the traditional perspective. So therefore, anyone who has a very intense desire to want to free oneself from samsara or from suffering or from any kind of sorrow becomes eligible automatically, right? Now, that is the traditional perspective. Now, I want to deepen that perspective from my own experience because I realized from, from teaching this for over two decades now is that Many, many a time people come into this knowledge because they are curious, not because they were looking for, looking mm-hmm. to remove some kind of uh, existential suffering or sorrow. Because when it's like this, you cannot, you cannot quench the thirst of a person who is not thirsty. Mm-hmm. Right? So when we, when a person walks into uh, a, a, what I call a conversation around this or a teaching around Advaita Vedanta without that thirst, without that hunger, no matter what you say is going to remain as an academic discussion. It is not going to be something that is really valuable. So a- extending that traditional perspective, we see, or rather I see, that a person who comes into contact with Advaita Vedanta would reap its full benefit only when there is clarity with regard to what is it that I'm trying to change? What, what is it that I'm trying to know? And by knowing, what is it that I want to attain? So when that clarity is not there, then this Advaita Vedanta, it's not Advaita Vedanta anymore because Advaita Vedanta is a pursuit of freedom. It's a pursuit mm. of moksha. If, if, it is, if, it, if Advaita Vedanta is anything other than the pursuit of moksha, then it's something else actually. I would say it's Advaita Vedanta based or mm. Advaita Vedanta informed or Advaita Vedanta oriented. We need to qualify that. You know, so that that is my experience. That has been my experience. Uh, so also in that context, is is you mentioned that the question should be clear. But I'm assuming for many students whom you have taught, this question becomes clearer in the course of the journey. Absolutely. Would- Absolutely. Because, uh, sorry, did I interrupt you? You, you, you want to say something? Yeah. So, so here, uh, there is a very nice point. Like you can see there is a two different type of seekers. Now, one is called a mumukshu, meaning that the one who wants freedom is one. Then there is another type of seeker who is called a jignyasu, who wants knowledge. Mm. So then the, the person who seeks freedom 
does not have does not have does not know the means to actually attain the freedom so the seeker of freedom becomes a seeker of knowledge that's when the clarity that like what you've said the question becomes clearer the question becomes deeper and the question is relevant to the person i use the word relevant because we all have different questions and through the different questions we come to the same point of saying that you know what i want a way out of this but the questions mm-hmm. can be different and that's the role of the teacher then the teacher converts the seeker of freedom to a seeker of knowledge through mm-hmm. a, what i call a very critical and discriminative inquiry with compassion now that's the purpose of the teacher and uh is it does it also go two ways so the seeker of freedom becomes a seeker of knowledge and does the seeker of knowledge become the seeker of freedom uh, so this depends if you look at it from an advaita vedanta uh, perspective mm. knowledge is freedom mm. so when uh, so it comes hand in hand is like two sides of the same coin actually with knowledge we become free so therefore i would say that the person who knows that this knowledge which is going to free them then automatically there is no necessity for me to add that you know seeker of freedom anymore mm-hmm. knowledge frees you so i mean we'll we'll come back to advaita vedanta many times during the course of this this conversation because that is the base or the core of what we talk but just getting to the theme of where we want to explore today are the themes of misconceptions or misunderstandings obviously i mean anybody familiar with advaita vedanta uh, would be aware that it's a very sophisticated a philosophy or or a way of life it's i mean it it does uh, and we we'll, i think we'll talk about the usage of words in 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 some time but uh, there is a lot of scope of misconceptions and they could obviously come from misinterpretation it could come from a misunderstanding it could even come from asking the wrong questions but mm. just moving in in that direction uh, dr kathirasan the one thing which we see often coming is the usage of bliss right bliss as the byproduct bliss as the objective or bliss in fact just presents present in the the famous term of satyadananda or the ananda part of it so how do we understand bliss and what are the common misconceptions associated with it yeah so the the, the problem with the word bliss as i mm. see it is because of the fact that it is an english word mm. now because we are conversing in english and 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 in english you know happiness and bliss is differentiated right they are both differentiated in that sense so bliss gives this idea that there's something more than happiness so this then creates a, a what i call a puts a person in the mode of striving meaning that you're looking for something other than what you have already experienced which then what happens then is that the bliss gives an i gives this impression that there is a state to be achieved and that state is going to give me a type of emotional experience because all all happiness is emotional experience there is no happiness that is not an emotional experience we will we, we will dissect this in a while but all happiness if you look at are you happy right now i will say yes you ask why i have to present to you an objective experience mm. right if you enquire into happiness is like that so i had a cup of tea i'm happy i met my best friend i'm happy so the happiness is always dependent on an object or sometimes that object can even be thought or memory right when i bring recall a particular memory i can also be happy but there is a change in the emotional state so the word bliss then gives you this idea that there is something greater than happiness and in that particular state i'm going to be in a very very different uh, you know state of uh, uh, what i call uh, mental experience so the moment i give bliss it gives the idea that my freedom is not available right now so any kind of word bliss, when the person uses bliss it gives this idea that th- i ha- this freedom lies in a state that i'm not experiencing mm-hmm. right now and even if i had experienced something like happiness this experience is greater than that happiness right it gives that so it postpones it procrastinates your freedom in that sense because you have evaluation of freedom itself is erroneous in that sense then why did this word bliss come up it's a good question actually so this happens because in the tradition of advaita vedanta sometimes ananda is qualified hmm. the word ananda which literally means happiness it's qualified by sometimes paramananda you know it's a transcendental happiness maybe the highest happiness or brahmananda so these terms are used to qualify uh, happiness now these terms uh, that are used uh, or even sachidananda 
So all these words are you, or when these terms are used, people conceive that this happiness is a greater type of happiness and they cannot find, I think, anything else in the English vocabulary. So they've given the word bliss. Mm. So the word bliss then creates this confusion then. Is this, is this uh, freedom that is, that is conferred through knowledge, is it some kind of emotional state? Is it some kind of emotional experience? Or, does, or is this not? So the word bliss then, in summary, creates this confusion. So what happens is it makes the seeker now wanting another state. Mm-hmm. You see, any, the desiring any state is going to only make me want to strive more and more. That means it is not available right now. If it is not available right now, that means I'm going to, con- I'm going to continue seeking and pursuing, mm-hmm. which then, in fact, that is itself suffering. That is itself sorrow. Because it, it, it is something that I need to do now mm. to displace my, uh, my state to, or my present state. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense in some way. It, it, it does make sense. Obviously, I mean, once viewed in the context of a hierarchy or of a gradation, there is, there is this illusion of it being in some distance away in time and space and something has to be achieved. And which is, I mean, which is obviously a common cause of suffering that I am limited at this point of time and there is something more to be achieved. Uh, But so how should one understand bliss then? Right. So the first thing that we need to see is we need to let go of the word bliss. That's, Mm -hmm. that's how I see it. Now we need to, we need to first let go of the uh, word bliss and try to understand the nature of happiness. Mm -hmm. What happened, what happens when I experience happiness? So it's a very typical, very, very typical and very simple uh, formula is I have a desire, I fulfill the desire, I become happy. That's a very, very simple experience that all human beings experience. So I, when, I, when I achieve my expectation or rather achieve the goal of the desire or based on all the criteria that I've set for myself, I feel happy. And the, uh, like, for example, the Taitriya Upanishad gives us three ways in which we experience happiness, right? It says, uh, um, Priya, Moda, Pramoda. It says three important words which means sometimes I can get happy when I have a thought about the object. Just by the thought of the object, I can be happy. That's some kind of what I call in today in psychology, they call it positive effect or pre-goal attainment positive effect. That's what they call it in psychology now. Mm. So before I attain the goal, there is some thought around it. I want to buy a car. You know, I, I want to buy this car. Every time I think of the car, I feel happy. The second type, the Upanishad says, is when I'm in proximity with that object that I want. It's called moda. That means now I'm, I'm closer to the object when by just seeing it, I mean, the sensory organs are now engaged with that object. That is a second type of happiness. The third type of happiness is when I achieve it. So mm-hmm. when I achieve it, pramoda, that means now I, I, I feel now I own it. That notion gives me a greater level of happiness. Now, the, the thing is, what this Upanishad says is all of these three types of happiness are actually emotional states. They're mm-hmm. actually a mental state that comes and it goes. So if freedom is equivalent to a type of happiness, then it can also come and it can also go. Mm. So therefore, moksha becomes now impermanent. Moksha then becomes a a state that would come and also go. So if moksha happens to be a state when discovered, I don't use the word attained, when discovered, uh, if it doesn't go away, then it cannot be an emotional experience. It's a very key point. It cannot be an emotional experience. In fact, uh, many, many people who, who, who are uh, seekers or uh, students of Advaita Vedanta may know Shankara, a very important commentator that we have in mm-hmm. the tradition. So Shankara makes a very important, uh, presents this argument in his commentary in the Brihadaranika Upanishad. He completely dismisses that this, this so-called, so-called happiness gained by the the liberated person is not an emotional state. In fact, the happiness that is taught in the Alvaita Vedanta tradition through the Upanishads is not a state at all. So it is not an emotional state at all. So by seeing that freedom, if it comes and goes, just like any other happiness state, because if I'm going to go after bliss, that means I'm not having it right now. Am I right? Mm -hmm. I'm not experiencing it right now. And I'm going to experience it at a particular point in time, which means at a particular point in time, it rises. And if it rises at a particular point of time, then it will also go at a particular point in time. So that happiness, this bliss, cannot be the same as the freedom or moksha that is taught. 
Right. And so, so something which, um, obviously it's a complex topic, but uh, something which you're referring to is also for beginners, it might be good to understand what it is not, the, the common niti niti technique, right? Because it's, yeah. it's, you can't describe it. It's, it's not something to put. And the moment you put a finger to it, this is that, and you're objectifying it, it's obviously not an object. So one way to understand bliss is basically to understand what it is not. And what it is not is an emotional state which you are mentioning. Yep, absolutely. It is not an emotional state that comes and goes. Uh, just a follow-up question, and again, uh, before we move on to other misconceptions, that something which is which often causes a con some confusion, at least when we start this Advaita Vedanta journey, is that many curious minds or seekers would actually understand that okay, it is not this emotional state which I got when I purchased a car or when I went to a movie or when I had a good food or drink, something. The follow-up question which immediately rises is then what is it? And that is the journey of Advaita Vedanta. That is a journey of self-exploration. But what would your suggestion be once somebody realizes that, okay, it's, it's not an emotional state? What would the immediate okay. next step be? Okay, very good. So this state, now imagine, first, let, let's, let's look at the way that we, uh, we live, all right, now. Mm -hmm. So if we are unhappy, we want to be happy right? That's, that's how our life is, right? Mm -hmm. I have different gradations of this happiness. Some are lesser happiness, some is greater happiness, but I want all states of happiness. Like I mentioned, mm -hmm. the three types of happiness. So I know if I'm miserable, I want to get out of that misery. So when I get out of that misery, I go to baseline experience. I call it neutral, right? That is a negative emotion, right? I want to get out of this negative emotion. I go to baseline, which is neutral. Then mm -hmm. from that neutral baseline, I want to now experience positive Mm. emotions. That's the next level. So we oscillate between this negative and this positive emotions. And in between is the baseline or the neutral reference pain, as I call it, right mm -hmm. in the middle. So this is our human experience. Now, imagine if you don't have to even seek this happiness. Mm -hmm. Now that's interesting, right? When I'm unhappy, miserable, I want to be happy. Now, suppose you don't even have to have that desire anymore. Why? Because now I see myself as someone or a being rather as complete and whole. So if I'm full, if I'm whole, if the self is whole, then there is a po no possibility of desiring a second thing mm -hmm. because I'm complete. So why is it that I'm not desiring a second thing is because there is no second thing mm -hmm. that is there in my vision. So there is no possibility of now desiring something other than where I'm already at. So that is a state where even happiness vanishes, the seeking mm -hmm. vanishes. So I don't need to be happy anymore because you know why? There is no second thing that's going to make me happy because there is only one reality or rather there is only this reality. And there is no, that, that, that goes. So, so that was a very interesting explanation, Dr. Karthi. So now I'll just re-articulate it and you can tell me if it's a good re-articulation. Is that we are swinging like a pendulum between good states and bad states and the common next question is, which state should I go to next? Whereas the answer is that there is no pendulum to be, to be swung and there is no state to go from A to B. Uh, and that becomes an interesting reference point in this journey from where we can pivot and understand what is it we are searching for. Absolutely, absolutely. To, to add on that one more statement, this is what that is the tradition sometimes calls um, in Sanskrit, praptasya praptihi, meaning accomplishing the already accomplished, right? So exactly, there's no more state to be. You are already that. Uh, so, and once we go into the next step, obviously the common question is the why, right? Why is this reality obscured and what is happening and why is this game being played in obviously in different answers, different traditions and the terms which we'll now encounter are maya or avidya, ignorance. So how do we understand those and where do we misunderstand them? Yeah, so the, the, the moment I see that, you know what, I am suffering, I am in sorrow, and I know that the only way out is to know this reality, know myself or know Brahman, mm -hmm. know consciousness, whatever word that we know of that can be used. Now, then why do I need to know this? Be then the, the by default, uh, what I call inference here is that I don't know it, right? Mm -hmm. So there comes ignorance or avidya, mm -hmm. as they call it. Now, this avidya uh, has been posited in two different approaches in the tradition. 
Now, one approach, uh, one approach is saying that I am miserable. I am, mm. I'm in this particular state where I see that I'm born, I'm striving and I'm going to die, etc. is because of my own ignorance. That is one approach. Now, there is another approach uh, that is also uh, postulated in the text, which is Maya, an objective reality, right through the three gunas, cause this so-called obscuration, as the word that you used, or even the projection. You know, they told the two powers uh, that is being said. So there are two approaches that has been presented in the tradition. Now, it, it, there is no there is no right approach between the two because what I I'm lear- continue I continue to learn. Um, from a pedagogical perspective, is that it depends on the person's disposition mm-hmm. and prior knowledge that we see the validity of one among the two approaches to be so-called acceptable to me. So I'm it. it so whether avidya is the problem or whether maya mitya uh, is a problem depends on my disposition. Actually, my own personality my own prior knowledge, my own prior wisdom is the one that determines which approach that I find uh, what I call a, a very, very re- resonant to me. Mm. So, so both approaches work, uh, looking at an objective obscuration or sometimes looking at it from a very subjective perspective, which is Avidya. Mm. Both work, actually, in my experience. Right. So the, the dis- distinction which we are making at this point between Avidya and Maya is that we are taking one as an individual ignorance and the other as a power of obscuration and the projection. Yes, absolutely. And your suggestion would be that we don't necessarily need to choose any one of these. It it depends on this individual's disposition. Exactly. It depends on the individual disposition. And also, I also realize one other thing is the skill of the teacher as well, to be Mm. able to shift gears when necessary. Um, Mm. So sometimes the the skill of the teacher here means the teacher has to be very discretionary depending on the, this is the whole idea, the competence of the student and also the disposition of the student. So the Mm -hmm. seeker meets the teacher, the the teacher would would then see which approach would work for the student. So, and where do these, I mean, what are the common misunderstandings or misconceptions which you have seen when it comes, I mean, it's obviously a huge, huge topic. Maya is, is, at par yeah, with the yeah. most discussed topic. So where do these common misconceptions arise and how do we yeah. counter them? Yeah, I remember listening to a lecture just yesterday, actually. So mm. uh, so my wife and I, we were listening to a lecture. And in this mm. lecture, the, the, the person who was uh, presenting the lecture, the lecturer, said that Maya is an illusion. Mm. So that is a misconception. Maya is definitely not an illusion. In fact, Maya, the word illusion gives the idea that something has been conjured. It's like the way the magician has, uh, you know, come up with a, uh, some kind of a visual, you know, optical or a visual, visual illusion. So the word English word illusion does not uh, adequately describe the nature of Maya. Now, Maya can be seen from different perspectives. I have to acknowledge that. From the, but from the standpoint of Advaita Vedanta, it is better to look at Maya as uh, with a very interesting word that is used, uh, which is called mithya. Now, mithya, the word, that's why you can see Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. The Jagat Mithya always comes, means the universe mm. is unreal, the universe is illusion. Many English uh, translations have been given. But the mm. word mithya denotes also another perspective that is given, which is very helpful in this pursuit, which is seen, which is to look at Maya as the whole universe of names mm. and forms. Right, uh, this the, all the, the all the objects of of the world, subtle and gross, in the in the form of uh, in the in the form of forms and which has a name can be called as Maya, and its nature can be called as Mithya. So here, Mithya denotes not just as falsity or illusion, but more of a dependent reality on something else. That means the universe depends on something. For its mm-hmm. existence, it is not existing independently. Now, what the, what does the universe depend on for its existence? Now, here comes consciousness, Brahman, Atma, etc. So, the word mithya then gives a very very realistic and pragmatic, uh, what I call appreciation of the world, where we mm-hmm. see the world as being reducible to one essential reality, and mm-hmm. that one essential reality which pervades the whole universe, creates actually the foundation and the very material cause of the names and forms. 
So to me, so this whole uh, appreciation of Maya as an illusion is quite different from looking at the world as having a, having a dependent reality, meaning that mm-hmm. it is a dependent reality. It depends on something else. Then through this, we can establish a cause and effect uh, relationship, meaning the universe being an effect is not separate from the cause. Mm-hmm. Uh, because it's always with the cause all the time. So that is perhaps one big misconception that I continue to see, uh, not all the time. I'm not saying all teachers are uh, teachers. This way. Sometimes we tend to see in books, especially older books, you know, 60, 70 years before mm-hmm. we see a lot of books written in English, you see the word uh, Maya as illusion. But these days we see less of that. So that's good news as well. Right. So, I mean, it, it actually changes the landscape pretty drastically, right? In in one case, you're seeing, and again, the definition of illusion is also fine-tuned in different texts. So one way of thinking it as an illusion is that there is nothing there and something is getting conjured. The other way to look at it is that something is there, but you're misidentifying what it is. Uh, but the, the, the third aspect, which you're saying that actually redefining it's not an illusion, it's there is a... It, the, the universe doesn't have an independent existence. And that changes the context substantially. But when we take it, again, I think a lot of what you said would still be relevant here, but when Mithya is taken purely in the context of Jagat or Jagat Mithya, and then we have these two distinctions. One is that everything's unreal. There is nothing there, which is very stark and drastic version of Advaita Vedanta, that everything is there's nothing there and there is only one reality and everything has no meaning. Nothing has any meaning, basically. And the other one is on the side of the dependent reality. So how would you explain the Jagat Mithya specifically in this context? So Jagat Mithya then we see as that the universe, mm-hmm. it depends on something that is Satyam, that is eternal. So that's how we look at Jagat Mithya. So the universe is dependent. So if, I, if we use the word Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, meaning Brahman is eternal, and then the universe is dependent reality. So now it will make sense. So if I were to re, if I were to reconstruct this sentence to make it, um, to to make to to anchor that into the uh, discussion that we're talking about right now, then Brahman is the reality. The universe depends on this reality. Hmm. So that's how we could construct it in that sense. So the universe that I see, Jagat, Mithya, here means Jagat is Mithya, meaning that Mithya means depending on Satyam for its reality. So therefore, hmm. we are not creating two separate statements, actually. They are talking about the same thing. And the other uni- un- beautiful thing that I, that I would like to share is that if you look at, I'm going to give an illustration here. Now, if the room is dark, all right, if the room is dark, and when the light is turned on, the question is, where did darkness go when the light was turned on? So interesting, right? It's not that the, the darkness left the room. So where there is light, darkness cannot exist. So the moment once something is known, the, the previous appreciation or understanding of it vanishes immediately. So the mm-hmm. moment Brahman is known as Satyam, the universe automatically gets falsified because you see it as dependent on, um, on Brahman. So that these two understanding that Brahman, mm-hmm. Satyam, Jagat, Mitya cannot coexist mm-hmm. in that sense. So in the wake of knowledge, darkness goes. The Jagat itself actually, in my view, the Jagat itself vanishes not from perception, but from our understanding that it has a independent reality that vanishes. Right. That's actually a connected question with that one, which is where did darkness go when the candle was uh, right, uh, lit up? Is is a very common question, which is where does Maya reside? Right? Where exactly is this, even if taken as a power right, or or as ignorance, where does ignorance mm-hmm. reside? Is it in yeah. the mind? Is it in the jiva? Where Where is it exactly? So Shankara gives the answer, answers this question. He says it resides with the person who asked this question. Huh. So he says the person who asked this question is the one who holds the ignorance. So that means here what uh, that again in the tradition there are two positions. Uh, uh, to be honest, some people say the the ignorance is with the self. Some say it's a universal ignorance. But mm. the point here is we need to we need to uh, what I call. Um, see if we could get away from a textual uh, presentation of this to my experiential 
appreciation of it. That that's why it makes a difference, right? Because Advaita Vedanta is not a concept. It's for it's Advaita Vedanta is for the person who wants to get out of misery, who wants to get out of suffering. So it is. So the question here about where does it reside? Actually, it's it's it. Sometimes it's a question of what I call uh, an exegetical question. Sometimes mm. people who want to understand what the text says. No, 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 no. We are looking at who is asking this question. Mm. So who is asking? I'm asking this question why? because I don't know myself. Right? That's why I'm asking this question. So where does this universe, where does this ignorance rise? To the one who is asking this question. So therefore it completely turns, the compass completely now is pointing towards the person who is asking the question. So it is now that what does what, what does it mean to me when Shankara says takes this position? I'm telling you what it means to me. It means to me Shankara says don't convert this into an academic discussion. Mm. Right? That's what he's saying. Don't convert this into an academic discussion. Look at it from your perspective. Let's let's now let's start the conversation. Now tell me what is it that you want to know, or what is it that you don't know? Right. And obviously, eventually, there are no two things in which there is an option. Where does it reside? So exactly, like like I have a I have a preference. I have mm. I use the word preference, not that it's an, it's a right thing uh, in that sense. I'm not I'm not going to polarize it. I have a preference to see it from my perspective. I don't know, mm. and that's why I'm in misery. I'm suffering. I don't know. It's got nothing to do with anyone else. Uh, there's no other uh, so-called power outside me that is creating this particular. Uh, problem for me. It's actually me. It is my ignorance, self-ignorance that is causing mm. nothing outside. That's my preference because I find it very, very helpful because I become now responsible and I'm accountable. As mm. opposed to saying, you know, there is some other power outside me that is causing all this. Then I, then I go in the, the train of thought of blaming some other, you know, some other mm. thing that has caused this misery. No, 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 no. I don't know myself. Therefore, I'm miserable. If I know myself, I'm whole, complete. Right. And, and another thing which you mentioned was the causal, uh, causal relationship or, right? So how do we understand the Jagat Karnam or right, the, the cause of what uh, these things? So the, the Jagat Karnam, meaning the, uni, the cause of the universe is actually uh, we, the consciousness or Brahman or Atma, whatever that we want to, whatever word that we want to use it. So we say the, 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 the Brahman has caused this universe without doing anything. So it's very important. It's like the costless cause mm. because it is, Brahman doesn't change. Brahman doesn't anything or rather my consciousness doesn't change. I use the word my consciousness. Yeah, I can drop the word my as well. Consciousness doesn't change. And in this consciousness, universe comes and goes. And what one traditional illustration that helps me to explain where did this universe come from? is like asking, where did the wave come from in the ocean? So if I, if I ask a person, where did the wave come from? They say, no, it came from water. Very good. Where is it going to go into? Into water. Then why do you call it a wave? Oh, because it had a distinct form. You answer the question. When, the, when, when, the, when consciousness takes a distinct form, all right, uh, with multiplicity, et cetera, variety, you give, it, you give it a word that is called uh, a universe. But when the form is not there, then you look at the substance of it. So, but even while it is having its form, it is still the same consciousness. Even when the wave is wave, it is still water. It does not lose its nature or it loses its intrinsic nature, which is water. So then what caused the universe? Consciousness. Is this universe right now devoid of consciousness? No. Where will it go to? Consciousness. Before the universe consciousness, during the universe consciousness, after the universe consciousness. So there is only consciousness. Right. And another, I think one common example is also given of the spider and the web. So that is, yeah. next. so it's, it's not something which is coming from outside. It is consciousness yes. and from that. It's yes. Emerging. Uh, spider, spider and the web gives the idea of the material cause, right? How material. the web is from the spider and mm. then it also brings it into, into itself. Mm. So it's a very nice open-ended example as well. Yeah. To illustrate this. Um, so moving on to a, a different topic, which is, which is something which again comes up again and again is the so a common understanding is that Advaita Vedanta, as you also mentioned, it is not attainment, it is discovery. Right? It is it is removal of ignorance to understand the absolute truth. And there is no way to go. Basically, it's it's similar. You light a candle, darkness goes away, light is illuminated. Then comes the question 
of what role do practices or meditation play mm. in this journey? Right. And again, I, I am assuming there were there are various schools of thought in this one, because on on one direction, if this is the absolute reality, it nothing much needs to be done. It is it is what it is. Right. And on the other direction, there is something to be done before you can get to that stage. So, what would your perspective be on these things? So, th- I see my perspective my perspective to be the traditional perspective as how mm. I've learned from the tradition as well. And I see the value in it as well. And it's very, very uh, coherent in that sense, mm. which is all practices are there for only one reason. Shankara calls it Chitta Shuddhi, meaning for the purification of the mind so that the mind becomes an apparatus that can retain and process the knowledge that is received from the, from the teacher, from the mm. tradition. So, so the all practices that, that's being observed or practiced by a person slowly purifies the mind. I mean, I use the word purification. Now, the purification is a very, very, um, can be very misleading. What does it purify? Mm-hmm. What does purity mean, right? That question may come up. So the whole idea of purification here means it makes the mind uh, such that it, it, it automatically has the fourfold, you know, competencies as they, as they are called, uh, sadhana chatushtaya, mm-hmm. which is the fourfold component for, for competencies that a person ha- needs to have in order for be eligible to be an adhikari or a learner or as uh, what I call um, an eligible seeker uh, in that sense. So what all practices do, meditation, uh, rituals, prayer, chanting, whatever practices that are there, all of them contribute towards the purification of the mind so that the fourfold competencies are attained by mm. the individual. That's the purpose. Uh, there's nothing else. And through the, but the purification by itself do not deliver the knowledge. Mm. They only make the mind fit for receiving knowledge. So that's why, that's why we, 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 I've encountered people who attend Vedanta classes. After 10 years, they still ask the same questions. Mm. After 20 years, the questions vanish. They give up the whole pursuit as well. Why? Because it's not the fault of the teacher. It's not a flaw of the teaching. It is my own, you know, flaws, which is called the lack of purification. So if I constantly listen to this with the teacher, having a conversation with the teacher, and I still don't see it, the problem is not with the teacher. The problem is not with the teaching. The problem is with the seeker because the mind is not ready. I, I, I would say it's like, I would illustrate this in a way like a pot, like, you know, water pot that has holes. Mm-hmm. Now, a water pot that has holes, naturally, if you were to pour water, the water would drain. Why? Because there are holes. So the whole, if I want to retain that water, I need to patch up the holes. Mm. Now, if I patch up the holes, then the, the water pot can hold water. The, that particular water pot is the self. When I use the word self, the individual, I mean. So we all have our own holes, you know, <laughs> flaws or lack of uh, what I call impurity. And rituals, all of this help us to patch up this holes. So even, even if I were to feel that I'm good, but there are flaws in me in that sense, there are impurities that I need to get to work on. If I go to a teacher, I may still not be able to retain that knowledge. Whatever that's given to me, it gets drained out. So that's the purpose of all practices, karma, uh, meditation, dhyana, all of them are for this particular purpose. And that's what Shankara states in his, in the tradition, that in, in, the, in, his, in his traditional text as well. Right. And so just taking the context of the fourfold qualifications, right? Uh, Vivek, Vairagya, Shamadi, Shad, Sampati, etc. Do you take them as sequential? As in the role of meditation could also be to measure ourselves as how we are progressing in getting to these qualifications. Yeah. So there are two types of meditation in Advaita Vedanta. Mm-hmm. Um, there are two specific types of meditation. One is called Vastu Tantra. The other one is called Purusha Tantra. So the Purusha Tantra meditation means that these are meditations that like Patanjali Yoga, like, uh, you know, uh, Dharana, m- uh, meditations that revolve around a thought or an object or even trying to process thoughts. So mm. these are called Purusha Tantra. Why is it called Purusha Tantra? Because there is a will involved. I, I choose to meditate. And actually, Purusha Tantra meditations are all actions, mental actions that are being uh, done. So that is one type. So this first type of meditation is the one that does the purification process. And it specifically revolves around the many of the attributes in the Shatka Sampati. Shama, Dhamma, Titiksha, Uparati, all of these are actually um, earned through meditation. Meditation has a very, very important role here 
but these are done through purusha tantra meaning they are meditation many times even chanting you know japa all of them can be um, in this category of meditation they do the job the second category is a different type of meditation this is called vastu tantra now vastu tantra meditation it is different they are technically it's technically called nididhyasana i'm sure that many many vedanta you know uh, seekers would know this word nididhyasana which is an entirely a different type of meditation because this is not meditation per se like you sit down and think of something no here you dwell on the very self the nature of the self itself mm. right it is the 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 like for example the one of the medieval teachers vidyaranya swami vidyaranya says it is for the removal of iparita bhavana opposing tendencies that actually iparita means that which opposes the nature of the self that is the purpose of nididhyasana but it entirely dwells on the self not an object not a thought etc it is the very nature the vastu or the consciousness itself so if you look at in terms of measurement meditation using meditation as a yardstick or a way to measure my progress actually meditation does not help me to measure my progress is actually the clarity of knowledge that helps me to measure uh, mm-hmm. the my the progress so there are two things that can happen rather one thing in two ways is that the more and more we get clarity the lesser questions we have right that's one way of measuring now the second way which is another thing is we also experience a certain degree of mental stability which comes as a secondary product it's mm-hmm. not a primary product but secondary outcome of this whole process there's a certain degree of mental mastery as we call it a certain degree of stability that a person experiences the person is like a like a mountain you know unshakable very very grounded emotions or situations do not sway the person's you know mind in that sense that is another secondary outcome that we see so these are uh, ways in which we can see whether how well we are progressing in that sense mm-hmm. but there is also another thing because lesser questions doesn't mean no questions uh, sometimes we see that lesser questions doesn't mean that i know the subject matter lesser questions can also mean that i'm losing interest as well mm-hmm. right sometimes i i because i'm tired you know i'm exhausted i know i've met people who after some time they abandon uh, this particular path no fault of theirs but it only means that the mind has not been adequately purified and therefore have lesser questions as well so lesser questions is not a only indicator but clarity the clarity is the one that creates the lesser questions not because i don't have any questions in interesting and actually so we have a couple of directions in the practices segment one of them is is karma yoga right karma yoga and how do we understand that the, the commonly mm. used understanding oh. is skill in action and right? yeah. how do we understand that and where is the misconception in 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 this term Okay. the biggest misconception in karma yoga is to look at it as an independent means to moksha or freedom now that's the biggest misconception uh, mm-hmm. that has been harbored by by many people they think that karma yoga means now i can serve people and then become free no uh, so the, the karma yoga as a teaching appears for the first time in the bhagavad gita nowhere else do we find it right mm-hmm. that's the earliest occurrence of uh, the teaching of uh, of uh, karma yoga so what is the uniqueness of karma yoga karma yoga is for a person who is active not for the sanyasi not for the renunciate it is for a person who is active like maybe i'm making this assumption maybe you could be just like me be active so it's for the active person of active disposition mm. active here means a person who has duties who engages with the world and through that uh, the person can use karma as an opportunity to purify the mind and this is the key thing that is the difference between karma and karma yoga so mm-hmm. karma means just action which is what everyone else does karma yoga is a specific attitude towards with i to with, with which i perform an action for the sake of purification of the mind that's a difference so again karma yoga directly does not lead to moksha because it's it's only purifies the mind mm-hmm. so it's like it, karma yoga patches the holes in the water pot that's what it does and through that a person becomes now eligible to receive and retain knowledge that's how it were that's how the tradition here yeah, shankara makes that very clear in his commentaries in the bhagavad gita as well and there is a lot of value to this perspective because number one i don't expect something more than what it delivers right now i don't have this you know expectation that karma yoga is one day going to liberate me no 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 it's not going to liberate you but it's going to purify you that's number one number two it also gives uh, us three important uh, ways in which i can observe karma yoga it's not about the, you know sweeping the ashrams going and serving people serving the needy all of that is not technically karma yoga provided i do it with a specific attitude so there are three important components in karma yoga 
first one is um which is said in the gita which is yoga karma sukaushalam which means that i perform my actions this with discretion what does that mean doing performing only actions that are aligned with my duties and responsibilities so if i'm an employer or let's say i'm a leader in an organization i only perform actions that are meant, that are part of my role i don't go and do the work of the finance director i'm actually encroaching into the person's duties actually that's not my duty paradharma that's not what i should be doing so my swadharma my duty is the only thing that i should be performing that's the first one and that too by virtue of it being my dharma it has to be only dharmic meaning ethically sound it cannot be unethical in that sense that's the first thing the second dimension is the way that i receive the results of my action that is called samatvam yoga uchchate in the gita which is the whole concept of the whole attitude of receiving all the results as a fruit of ishvara or fruit of the 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 reality that is that has become this universe whatever word that you want to call it you can even call it god ishvara or you can call it consciousness reality whatever that you want to call it but we know that i am not we know that i am not the author of those results so therefore the results are are contributed by so many different forces and uh, factors and they contribute to the results so therefore i don't take ownership of the results i accept it i accept it gracefully that is called samatva equanimity right that there's a third component which is there which is meditation itself which shankara uh, adds as well meditation is also built into the in karma yoga for the for the specifically in the shama dama uparati titiksha samadhana all of for that purposes it is there so these three are very very uh, three these three attitudes and observances are very important for a karma yogi so to say knowing that this is not going to liberate me <laughs> this is a key thing i do this knowing that that is not going to uh, uh, free me in that sense but it is going to help me to free myself through knowledge that's mm-hmm. the very important point so this stands quite it this stands um in a place which is quite different from the way karma yoga is conventionally understood so people think karma yoga means i can start an organization do seva help people you know and then by, by doing that i can attain moksha no from the standpoint of advaita vedanta if a person does that you're only going to be in samsara there is no way out unless we perform those actions with these three, these 2 plus 1 important um, aspects right and Uh, i mean since we are on the topic of moksha or or liberation or right? so where does samadhi and moksha coincide and what is the relationship between these two so the word samadhi um interestingly does not appear very much in shankara's commentarial works mm-hmm. there's a reason for that um firstly the word the, the word samadhi has been unduly popularized by yoga by the yoga traditions the yoga traditions have really made samadhi like some super conscious uh, experience and a state where there are no thoughts etc and the second area second place from which this popularity comes from is patanjali yoga sutras and the commentators asam prajnata samadhi which they feel that there is a state of no concepts no mm-hmm. uh, uh, thoughts right the uh, they call it uh, chitta vritti nirodha as it is called attenuation of all thoughts thought thought thoughts of vrittis thought forms so interestingly vedanta does not teach the attenuation of thoughts to start with that's the first misconception people have people think that the samadhi when used in vedanta although it doesn't appear in shankara's works but later vedanta teachers use the term uh, but they use it very differently like for example they would not they use the word nirvikalpa samadhi is one word that is used in the vedanta tradition compared to the yoga tradition there are two different types of samadhi so samadhi could mean many many different things in vedanta but it is not moksha it is either it is sometimes seen as a practice that is being done a concentrative practice sometimes samadhi can take that form sometimes even the whole process of listening to the teacher processing it meaning removing doubts and then doing nididhyasanam can also be called samadhi shankara calls that samadhi in his brahma sutra commentary he uses that now sometimes samadhi itself is used as a mind that is completely uh what i call absorbed in knowledge of the self mm. also called samadhi but if you realize nowhere is samadhi in vedanta described as a thoughtless mind that is the big that is the most subtle point here 
nowhere in the Advaita Vedanta tradition where people are taught to practice samadhi and arrive at a state where there are no thoughts. This is the biggest misconception uh, when it comes to the appreciation of samadhi. So therefore, the yogic samadhi, which is, which is usually uh, described as a thoughtless state, is quite different from the samadhi in Vedanta, which can mean many things, but none of them refer to a thoughtless state because mm. um, to bring back the bring back the example, the illustration of the wave and water, you don't have to destroy the wave to see its nature as water. Even if there is a wave, you can know the wave to be as water without having to destroy it. So this is a very nice line that comes in the uh, Kena Upanishad, Pratibodha Viditam Matam, which mm. means it is seen in every cognition, meaning that in every thought, there is consciousness. In every thought, there is the self. In every thought, there is Brahman. So if it is available in every thought, do I have to alleviate or attenuate the thought? Not necessary at all. So where there is thought, yatra yatra manayati tatra tatra samadhiha. It says wherever wherever the mind goes, there is samadhi, meaning there that samadhi is, there is the consciousness. So hmm. if it is available in every thought, I don't have to remove the thought. Where there is thought, I am free. I need to discover that freedom. So therefore, samadhi as a thoughtless state, often uh, presented as a thoughtless state, is totally unnecessary to be free. Though, though I want to qualify, though practitioners who practice this removal of thoughts can actually get a, can gain a certain degree of mastery over the mind. That cannot be denied. So I don't want to dismiss. Uh, the the, um, the the what I call the purification, the value that it contributes to mental purification. So removing the thoughts like Patanjali Yoga practices where people try to still the mind, uh, etc. Removing thoughts, all of them contribute to the mastery of the mind, but they do not lead a person to freedom directly. So if you a person practices meditation, go ahead and do it, but know fully well that it's not going to free you, but it's going to make your mind a little more stronger though it is not the only method. There are many methods to it to, to for mental purification. Perfect. Well, uh, Dr. Kantrasan, this has been a wonderful conversation. I think lots and lots of concepts, I, I wouldn't call misconceptions were clear because you introduced new concepts as well. This has been a great learning journey. But before we end, any particular shloka, story, anecdote, which has stayed close to your heart in your journey? I... There is the, the, the tradition, uh, which is very nice shloka that I, I appreciate, which is the, it's a very popular shloka. She says, Sadashiva Samarambam, Shankaracharya Madhyamam, Asmadacharya Paryantam, Vande Guru Parampara. So this method of Vedanta is not found in the text. This is something that I, it was, a great discovery for me. He said, even as I'm sharing this, I feel, feel very good just talking about this because it is not in the text. It is in the hands of the teacher. And the teacher that, that I learned from, learned from his teacher. Mm. And that teacher learned from his or her teacher. The gender is not important here. It's the knowledge. Right? So her teacher, his teacher, it goes on. That's what, what, that's what it means, Bande Guru Parampara, that we salute the, te- the, the tradition of teachers. And it goes back all the way to, we say, Ishwara. That means what? What does Ishwara mean? The fundamental reality that caused this universe. So why do we say that? Because the knowledge that we gain is not apart from that universe itself. It's not apart from the reality itself. That's number one. Number two is actually, I don't know. I don't know where it came from, actually. That's why it disappears, right? When you inquire further, there'll come a time where you stop and then there's a dotted line and goes to, we say, Ishwara or Sadashiva, Mm -hmm. Narayana, whatever that you may call it. So this shloka is something very special to me because it is not in the text. It cannot be written in that sense because what does it mean? It's not conceptual. It is... What today many of us may know, like, you know, coaches or counselors or therapists, they don't have a very, what I call, clear method, but they have a direction. They, they know that they want to help the client, 
like a coach comes or a, or a therapist meet a client, they come. The therapist knows, the coach knows that the person who is coming into the room wants to free themselves of some burden. <laughs> they want to achieve some goal. So the therapist or the coach knows that there is a goal. There is a goal. But how they get there is entirely being present. It's a conversation. It's a dialogue. It's a very beautiful conversation because the therapist or the coach will never lose sight of the goal. Now, that is the parampara. That is a very clear method that is handled. And if you, and, and if you, you look at how I helped this person and I realized that this is how I did, and you realize you cannot use the same method with another person, right? Another person would come into the room and you realize, hey, yeah, I know I want to help the person. That is very clear, but you would not use the same method. So the, there is one method that doesn't change in the Vedantic tradition. But the way that I employ the method, the way that I employ the method through the conversation, it changes because every seeker is different. And that comes, and that method that doesn't change comes from the tradition. And the same way to use the method also comes in the tradition. So to that tradition, we have to be very, very indebted because it is somehow I don't know. I don't think I'm only a beneficiary of a receiver, right? A beneficiary of the knowledge and value that he had created. But I don't know how it was created in that sense because it's a wonder. If I look at the way it has been written, the method of Veta Vedanta, for example, Adhyaro Papavada is one method. And there are other prakriyas that are there. It's a wonder. It continues to be a wonder to me. Sometimes I can't believe how a human mind could possibly, you know, the teachers could have, you know, produce these methods through negation and, and telling us what is there as an essence. So that is continues to be a wonder. So I, I kind of uh, uh, appreciate and value this particular shloka. Right. And on the note of Vande Guru Parampara, thanks again for taking the time and sharing your insights. I, I'm sure this will be very useful for many people and at least take them in the right direction. And from there, obviously, everything is a journey and they'll explore more and understand more. But thanks again, Dr. Kathirasan, for taking the time. It's been wonderful having this conversation with you. Thank you for having me, uh, Deepak. It was a pleasure uh, having this conversation with you. I felt that I was having a conversation with you more than actually teaching anything, actually. So, you know, great questions. Um, uh, so inside, so many insightful questions, which allowed uh, both of us to have a conversation in this um, in this podcast. Thanks for having me. I appreciate that. Thank you.